Welcome back to the Keegan and Company podcast. For those who are new to the show, my name is Keegan Hipgrave. And if you haven't already, could I get you to jump over, hit that little subscribe button. It's a great way for us to grow the podcast, grow the platform, and just have some amazing conversations like I'm going to have today. In this episode, I'm not joined by an athlete, but I'm joined by someone with incredible insight into performance, sleep, recovery. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Dean Miller from Adelaide. Dean and I sat down a couple of weeks ago with the Whoop team as part of Whoop House. If you're watching on YouTube or even if you're listening on Apple and Spotify, it's going to sound a little bit different because it was a live conversation between Dean and I. We had an incredible conversation around sleep, performance, circadian rhythm, what to do before going to sleep. It was an incredible conversation, not only for athletes, but for everyone. Uh, guys, I really hope you enjoy this conversation. I had an incredible time talking with Dean. Enjoy. Did anyone else fall asleep in the breath work this morning? <laughs> was there anyone else? There was one up there at, at the back? Really? Yeah, almost there. Yeah. Feeling very zen. I'm feeling very relaxed, Rory. Thank you, mate. We're good to go. All right, guys, settle in, settle in. If you need some water or if you need any drinks, settle in. Um, we've, got a, we've got a really cool uh, chat today. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Keegan Hipgrave. Uh, my background is rugby league, so NRL. Um, I was in the rugby league system for eight years with the Parramatta Eels and Gold Coast Titans. Um, I was medically retired two years ago and, and ended up starting a mental health and sport podcast, which uh, led me here today. Uh, I'm really excited to have this conversation um, with Dr. Dean Miller, um, a sleep scientist who uh, did his PhD um, in Adelaide, uh, working with uh, predominantly around sleep and jet lag amongst athletes. Um, but Dean, before, I guess before we kick into it or get started, I'd love to know your role at Whoop, how you got involved yep. and, and where it all started. Yeah, easy. It's a bit of a long story, to be honest. That timeline that Brian put up, um, I can see exactly where uh, I started with Whoop. So I was a PhD student in Adelaide, oh, I would have started in 2017. Yep. Um, basically jumping on any projects that I could do around athletes. I was the only person working with athletes in that lab, so uh, anything in that area I sort of like jumped on. Uh, and then one day, uh, Professor Shona Housen, who's like the sleep lord yeah. um, in, athlete, in the athlete space, uh, just, I got a package and it was full of Whoop 2.0s. And it was, there was just a note that said, like figure out how these work, <laughs> yeah. put them on uh, people in the lab and let's see how well they work. So mm. that was my introduction. It was pretty crude. I was literally just taking screenshots of the data and, yeah. and trying to work out how, how this uh, new device works in the lab. Um, so that's my introduction and then it just grew from there. So uh, ended up striking a relationship with Emily Capitolupo, mm. who's the uh, head of data science uh, at Whoop. Um, and then yeah, that grew from there doing validation studies. That COVID study that Brian talked about um, was a paper that uh, I, I wrote with Emily and, mm. and the team. So they wanted a third party to write the paper, obviously um, collaborate with us on that. Yep. So again, COVID was a big uh, growth uh, period for, for me. And then, yeah, it's just been growing since then. Mate, it's very cool. And we've got a lot of athletes and, and corporates and a lot of different individuals from a, a different array of, of sports. Why why sport? Like, why did you go down the sporting, um, I guess, like field of sleep? Yeah, for sure. Um, almost a little bit embarrassing to say in this room, but yeah, I was an aspiring athlete. Mate, don't play kid. it down. Tell everyone what you're um, doing. Yeah, I, I just wanted to play cricket as yep. a kid. So uh, that was my main focus uh, up until the PhD, really. So um, I was like, what can I do related to what I actually want to do, play sport? Uh, and then I fell in. Uh, I met uh, someone who worked with the South Australian Institute of Sport. He did a talk about sleep. Mm. I latched onto him. He was an athlete as well. So... Uh, sometimes when you work in academia, you get some interesting characters. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Michele Lastella, um, he was a soccer player, um, and he, yeah, he was he was almost like a coach rather than an academic. So yeah. I just latched to him, and, and that's how it all started. But that that's unreal. And I know you've done a lot of work with Whoop in the validation space. But have yeah. you, are you working with other athletes at the moment? Other clubs? What, what's that looking like at the moment? Yeah. So. Roughly in the last 12 months, I've transitioned sort of out of academia and the research space. I'm still involved, but not as intensive, staying up late nights in the lab. Um, so I've started my own consultancy. So I work with the Australian Institute of Sport. So I generate jet lag plans and uh, measure sleep and give advice to basically any national Australian athlete um, that's going to the Olympics, Paralympics or uh, Com Games. Um, so if you're one of them, um, you can come to me and I can help you out. Yeah. Um, and then the rest of my time at the minute is with Air Force. So mm. 
Uh, a little bit different to the athlete space, a uh, bit more uh, workforce based, um, but we do get to work with some pretty impressive athletes and the jet pilots and the, the fighter pilots and all that. But yeah, that's my time at the minute. But uh, I'd love to, um, I'd love to zoom in on the whoop, and I'd love mm -hmm. to talk about the matri the metrics. I've been using mine for probably just about twelve months now, yep. and I know we, you know, Brian spoke about the the metrics that they're using and the data that they're tracking in terms of performance, because we do have so many athletes from a variety of different sports here. What are probably some of the key metrics that we should be looking at or we should be focused at in terms of performance? Is it HRV? Is it total sleep time? What, what do you think the, the big ones that we should be looking at? Yep, so they all have utility. Um, and once you sort of start wearing them, as Brian said, uh, you have to wear it to understand the product. Um, I think for me as a scientist, I guess we always look at the raw data uh, first. Uh, so total sleep time is the first thing I would look at if, when I check my data. So I want to make sure that I'm obtaining seven to nine hours of sleep yeah. regularly. Um, one night less than that is fine. It's long-term trends. And it was a bit like the COVID paper as well. Mm. We're looking at trends rather than time points. Um, so total sleep time for sleep. Uh, any variation within that as well can be interesting um, in terms of sleep staging. So it might suggest a change in physiology um, that you may not have picked up in your behavior. What, is, what does that mean for the average punter? So yeah, it, if your REM sleep drops considerably or, or your, uh, the makeup of your sleep stages changes um, from a, the baseline that we've collected over 30 days and, mm. and continuously, um, it, it's not the end of the world. It may just be uh, some sort of physiological uh, variable that you don't, might not know, might be tracked in the, in the WHOOP coach yeah you might be able to see it through there but as long as it goes back to that baseline of before then you're fine and and looking you said seven to nine hours is the quality of sleep i imagine quality of sleep is something that's probably pretty important as well in terms of yeah. you talked about REM sleep but what about deep sleep versus light sleep what, what what are the what are the key differences yeah so basically uh the stages of sleep will go from light slow wave sleep REM Light is basically most of your sleep, so that's going to be the predominant uh, sleep stage. Slow wave sleep is more related to like muscle restoration, so if you're uh, training, hard, yeah, training, training hard. at a high intensity, yeah. um, it's going to assist you in not being super sore. I know when I was training and working in the sleep lab, I'd always be super sore because I was training and then not sleeping, mm. um, so I wasn't recovering. Um, so that's a slow wave sleep part of it, and then REM is more cognitive. So. Uh, if you ever get a bad sleep and then you, you find yourself in a brain fog the next day or uh, your reaction time, if that's relevant for your sport, is, is down, um, that may be potentially because your REM sleep was cut short. Um, and that's probably a common one because REM sleep is at the end of our sleep usually. Yeah. So if you get up earlier than you usually do, you're probably going to miss out on a chunk of REM sleep. I thought I thought um, it was sleep cycles. So yeah. so is that is am I correct in saying that? Yeah. Where you, if you get eight hours of sleep, you usually go through eight different yeah. sleep cycles throughout, and then the REM is at the end of that. Correct. Yeah. So there is a, a, a cycle to it, um, but there is slight waiting either end. So uh, you will get more REM sleep. You will still cycle through all of the stages throughout the night, but m more of the REM sleep will be at the end. So yeah, if you do get up for training and cut that off, you're just losing that sleep. It's not gonna, your body doesn't know that you're gonna wake up gotcha. earlier than usual. So um, that's the consideration around REM. Yeah. It, especially around REM, because I, I know there's, we've got a lot of crew in here and, and you know, some are in the, in the sporting world and, and others might be in the corporate world, but learning a new skill. And you talked about REM sleep and you talked about how that's great for cognitive function. Yep. What are, what are the best things that we can do to help if, you know, if we're trying to learn a new study or if we're trying to learn a new skill physically, like yep. are, the, are the, all these things considered when, when you're looking at REM sleep? Yeah, for sure. I think for, not just for REM sleep, but for all of the sleep stages, the best thing you can do is be consistent with your sleep timing. So uh, we have these 24 hour rhythms, circadian rhythms. Yep. Um, and basically what that rhythm is doing is preempting when we're going to be sleeping and when we're going to be waking up and the body gets used to that over a period of, period of time. So it, uh, it has like a, 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 not a clock, but we can call it a clock that um, it wants to be in REM sleep at this part of the day yeah. and that'll change. So if you're doing it at the same time every day, your body's not thrown out of whack at all and you're getting all of that required sleep. Um, you're not cutting short REM. So if you do that consistently, that's gonna tick all your boxes for gotcha. if you're doing some skill acquisition uh, in some sports or um, anything cognitive loading, mm. um, that's basically the best thing to do. Yeah. And, and in terms of prepping for the best night's sleep, like yeah. if, we're, if we're talking about the most ideal nightly routine or whether it's uh, in the morning, I know people say, you know, get up and get, get the, 
the light first thing in the morning, the yeah. sunlight. What what would you recommend to be the best twenty four hour routine to give us our best night's sleep? Yep. So routine is everything, basically. Uh, as I said, we've got that twenty four hour rhythm. Um, in terms of like a, a pre bed routine, I think it's really important, not just um, for uh, mentally, or it's more of a um, a behavioural trigger. Yep. That's how I sort of think about it. Um, and we were talking about this before. I think probably the lowest hanging fruit is uh, house lighting. Gotcha. So we get there's a lot of media about the the lighting in our phones and and the blue light that come out of our phones. But um, the the house lighting that we have is actually worse for us. Yeah. Um, if we have all the lights on at night, um, we're not like physiologically back when we lived in nature. Uh, our sleep was anchored to the sun. So um, when we have lights on at night. We're not used to that at all. Does that all. mean we have to cook in the dark? What does that, what does no. that look like? <laughs> yeah, within reason. Um, so I'll, typically I'll, what I do is as soon as the sun goes down uh, or as soon as it starts getting dark, mm. uh, I just yeah, keep it as dim as possible. Obviously cook in some sort of light, yeah. um, but definitely don't have all the lights on. I think people, I think on TikTok or something, they call it the big light. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. don't turn the big light on um, and keep light to a minimum. Obviously, if you need to do something for five minutes mm. with the lights on, that's fine. But... Uh, what that does is if, you, if you're seeing light at night, it moves your body clock later. Okay. Um, so the next night you might get to bed at the same time and you might be sitting there wide awake because your body clock thinks it's an hour later. Gotcha. Yeah. And even because I know just for me personally, I'll, I'll stay up and I'll do like a lot of my study at night. I'm yep. studying psychology at the moment. So I've got my big screen. I've got my laptop. I've also got my phone next to me. We talked before blue blockers, the, yep. the, the glasses, the, the orange glasses that you use to prevent... Mm -hmm blue light from coming in is that something that can help or is it a matter of just turning everything down if possible they, they can certainly help i think the first thing to do though is just to turn the lights down yeah. um and the screen so if you're working on a big uh screen or you're working on something like that um you can turn the brightness down uh there's some features like the night features that that uh soften the light mm. so definitely do that and if you want to wear blue blockers as well um or in situations where you can't control the light environment, blue blockers can help. But um, yeah, if, if you're working late at night, which is fine, uh, if that's your routine, then yeah, just turn the lights as dim as possible. But you also you also talked about the the behavioural aspect of being on your phone, yeah. and it's not so much the light, but what but what yeah. is it? You know, when using your phone late at night. Yeah, so you will you will hear me recommend like put your phone away uh, an hour before bed, and that's really not because of the light that it emits. It's just the behavioural aspect of it is literally just delaying your bedtime gotcha. because you're scrolling or uh, yeah you're sending emails or something like that mm. so um, whenever I'm working with like traveling athletes or athletes that do struggle with putting away their phone I always give them uh, advice to have like a checklist of their device devices so okay text whoever text Keegan uh, I want to do this before I get to bed on my device yeah um, because then you're not lying there going oh just, what's just, next what I'm yeah. gonna do yeah yeah so it's the behavioral thing of just delaying bedtime rather than the light so that's probably the main thing around uh devices itself yeah. so we're, we're turning our lights down we're getting off our phone an hour before bed what what are some other things what are some great good little habits that we can all get into to give yep. us the best night's sleep like what are we missing here uh it probably leads on a little bit from turning the lights down is uh getting sunlight at the yep. right time so uh, morning and evening sunlight um, basically that helps our body know what time of day it is um, so when the sun is at a low angle so morning when it's rising and evening when it's setting um, getting out into into the sun without sunglasses so it's going into your retina that's basically how our brain knows what time of day it is um, so you're yeah, getting that evening and afternoon light especially in winter because we obviously have less of it mm. um, and that's been shown so in in the states and, and areas that has very little sunlight uh there's seasonal anxiety and depression mm. uh and it's because of the light right so um really make an effort to to get outside and as a byproduct you get outside and go for a walk anyway so yeah. it's good for your health as well is that you you were talking before a bit a bit off air that you're working with a lot of olympic athletes is that something that you're conscious about when you go over there even for even for jet lag like that's probably yeah. something pretty cool to, to lean into yeah so the main way that we yeah, get athletes to recover from jet lag is light yeah. um, because as you as you can expect when you fly overseas sun sunset mm. and sunrise are at, are at different times so um yeah it, it's a bit probably scientific to go into but we might say so if you're flying to paris i'll say Keegan, uh, i'll get your normal sleep times and i'll say you should get light the sunlight mm. between 1 p.m and 3 p.m 
and then avoid light after that because that's going to move you into the time zone. Yeah. Um, because you can actually get stuck. I, c I could make you jet lagged forever if <laughs> if I had yeah if I had you in, in a lab I could just have you jet lagged forever. So. And what 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 do those studies look like? Because you said you work out of Adelaide. You said you've got yep. your whole sleep lab. I know Whoop, you're doing a lot of work with Whoop in, in, in Adelaide. Oh, sorry, in Boston. Um, what do those studies kind of look like? Like, and without going too technical yeah. in the science world, but for us everyday, um, everyday punter, what does that look like in terms of we inhibit their sleep? We try and promote more sleep. Like, how how does that yeah. look? Uh, I think I do have some slides a bit later, maybe of, of the actual lab, which is interesting. So basically, the sleep lab is you may have seen photos of people with all the wires on their heads going to sleep. Not great to sleep in, but mm. it is what it is. Uh, a lot of the studies that we do in a lab are often funded by government projects so they usually aim towards like sleep disorders and stuff like that um, but my research is more in the field so the jet lag one yeah. that you mentioned uh, we got some athletes over from England um, measured their body clock which is actually through urine which was really fun to do right um, so it's more more challenging in the field um, but yeah sleep lab is full control of the light mm. so we, we can control it down to uh, the percentage uh, and yeah some of the studies, we have them in there for 16 days straight. No windows. Uh, it, I'm not selling it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Don't worry. I don't do it anymore. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, some of those studies are pretty pretty crazy. Um, and then others, like during my PhD, we did one with uh, evening exercise yeah. where people just came in three nights, worked out, went to sleep, and we saw what happened. And how, how do you go, mate, with sleep? Because you're, you're, you've done a lot of research, yeah. and for anyone who has studied or have done, um, I'm sure they've done late nights, <laughs> How, how you go with it? Because I imagine it'd be pretty hypocritical if you <laughs> yeah. were staying up late and you, and you were working on sleep. How do you find that? Yeah, I think in a normal environment, I'm a pretty good sleeper. Mm. I was beforehand. Um, a lot of sleep researchers are bad sleepers and that's why they go into it. Gotcha. Um, but I wasn't one of them. Uh, but when you are a sleep researcher, yeah, sleeping is very hard because the critical periods of the studies are at night. Yeah. Um, so you often don't get a lot of sleep. So um, I was wearing my whoop throughout my PhD. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I actually got some data for where my body just said no. Mm. Like, yeah, it was a, a prolonged period of being in the lab and uh, I was ignoring the red recoveries yeah. and, the, and the bad sleep. And then, yeah, I, I just, it just said no. And I had a few weeks on the couch. And what and what do those what do those side effects look like? The side effects, sorry, because I know probably all of us, maybe not all of us, but there's some of us here, and I won't name any names, uh, Millie Boyle. But there's a uh, there's a couple here that have, we've been in the red, like we we yeah. hit the red, and, and we we're working hard, we're training hard, um, we might be staying up late, we might have had too many beers or drinks one night. What are the firstly probably what are the side effects of getting a bad night's sleep? But then also, what can we do to help that the next day? Yeah, I mean. It yeah, I, I have my fair share of red as well. So it's not, it's not something to be overly concerned with unless it's always red. Mm. Um, but it, it can manifest in different ways for different people. Uh, for me, it was physical. Mm. So I, I literally thought I had chronic fatigue gotcha. um, during that period. And I knew all the stuff that I know now already. So I was like, obviously not implementing it. Mm. Um, but it can manifest in different ways. So you might be more cognitively impaired. So reaction time or you might just uh, write terribly or something like that depending on what, on what uh, job you're doing um, but yeah that's the thing about sleep it, comparative to other sciences we don't know that much about it yeah. and that's why whoop can help sort of in terms of uh, collecting data in the mm. wild rather mm. than in a really controlled sleep lab. That's something that's super interesting because we do have a lot of athletes in the room um, and I know, like, it's, it's obvious. Like, when I have a bad night's sleep, I feel pretty shitty the next day, to be yeah. honest. And you talked about reaction time. I mm -hmm. imagine, like, cognitive learning would be another one. Yep. Is there anything, like, even fatigue level, like, energy levels? Is there is there anything else I'm missing there in terms of poor, like, yeah. side effects of a poor night's sleep? Yeah, there's a few. That, they sort of roll into each other, right? So... Um, if you're getting a bad night's sleep, obviously, performance-wise, you're going to be impaired. Um, in terms of energy balance, it doesn't like affect it uh, directly, but when we're fatigued or we're sleep-deprived, we have a predisposition for bad food. Yeah. So I know when I was doing night shifts, I would... Um, this was way back when, and I had a mate that worked at a bakery, and I would just grab whatever was left over in the bakery and just eat that What's overnight. What's pretty choice, mate? A couple of croissants? Oh, uh, like those little savoury bites? Yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I would eat terribly. And, and we see that consistently across nurses, doctors, um, that when we are awake for a certain period of time, 
um, yeah, we make bad choices mm. that then affect, um, yeah, so diet mm. and, um, yeah, we load caffeine at the wrong times. Yeah. And yeah, so it's a flow and effect. It may, sleep may not f affect it directly, but it's going to lead to behaviours that affect your health as well. And I think, like, and so uh, what else are we missing? Is, does, does it affect energy levels, did you say? Like, is that, is that something that w you said it doesn't really? Not directly, so, like... Uh, it, Why do I feel tired after yeah. a bad night's sleep? You know what I mean? So basically the, the mechanism for that while you're feeling tired is there's a buildup of something called adenosine in your brain. I won't get too, too crazy with that. But mm. basically from the minute you wake up, um, it starts building up in your brain. Mm. And what caffeine is, it's a very similar molecule. So when you have a caffeine, it blocks... Yeah. <laughs> you're right. Uh, it blocks that site. So it gets rid of... Well, it doesn't get rid of it. It blocks the tired hormone. Um, for a period of time and then it comes back. So that is the feeling of tiredness um, in terms of energy. So if you didn't eat, for example, uh, and you went for a training session, that's slightly different. That's mm. more like a glucose metabolism uh, type of thing. Um, but sleep can impact it. So yeah, you can draw lines towards it, yeah. um, but it's more of a flow on effect. If you get one bad night of sleep, it's not gonna throw out your like uh, diet and glucose levels. Like, you know what I mean? Gotcha. Yeah. So what's, what's a couple things that we can do the next day? So say if we do have a really bad night's sleep, we might have stayed up a little bit too yeah. late. Uh, we might have been indulging uh, a little bit later in, in the night. But what are some things that we can do? Is it pulling back on training? Is it, is it having it? Does naps help? Like what, yeah. what, are, what are some things that we can do the next day? Oh, definitely. If you have time, nap. Um, yeah, nap is the only way that you can restore that side of fatigue. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you have time, 20 to 90 minutes, probably before 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. if you're sleeping on a normal schedule. Um, so yeah, you can, uh, you can even try, um, we tried to trademark this, we didn't actually try to trademark it, but the nappuccino. So you have a little coffee, Yeah. Okay. have a 20 to 30 minute nap, and by the time you wake up, the caffeine kicks in and then you don't feel groggy. Gotcha. Um, yeah, it's, if you're a good napper, uh, definitely try that. Yeah. And, so, and, and, sleep, and sleep anywhere, does, does um, the perfect, is that, like, yeah. when, I, when I think about the perfect um, like sleeping routine, what, yeah. what does that look like in terms of like temperature or is, what, are the, what are some key things that we can do there? Yeah, so we want, it, we want the room to be, um, we call it like thermo neutral. So it's like 19 to 23 degrees so that your body's not working to heat or cool. Mm. Um, so that environment, dark um, and reclined. So um, we've done studies with uh, like airline chairs yeah. and sitting upright is terrible for sleep. Well. So, okay. I mean, who would nap? Uh, you usually wouldn't nap sitting up, but try and recline um, and then yeah set it set a time we don't do it more than 90 minutes because yeah. that might affect your sleep that night okay um so that one that 90 minutes is about one sleep uh, cycle mm. so um yeah we don't want to do any more than that beautiful beautiful mate i um i do want to talk about one of the metrics uh hrv yeah. heart rate variability why is that such a topical subject um why do i see hrv everywhere <laughs> like firstly what is it and yeah. and how and how can it help you know a bunch of a bunch of athletes and, and yeah. corporate athletes in the room yeah so i i sort of fell into that hrv as well i'm not uh the hrv expert there's a lot of people out there that know a lot more than me but basically um we have two branches of our autonomic nervous system so we've got the parasympathetic slows us down i remember that like a parachute yeah parasympathetic uh, and then sympathetic is more we call it the stress side of it but it's uh it's also the the side of the uh, nervous system that like keeps you alert mm. so when you were playing rugby league that your sympathetic was activated to to I don't know, track track down the players mm. and tackle and perform so it's not a bad thing um basically what hrv is measuring is the the push pull between those two branches there's never you're never always going to be 100 percent parasympathetic or 100 percent sympathetic mm. um so hrv is basically a measure of that without going too uh detailed into it so higher hrv is uh associated with better outcomes i guess so um more recovery mm. um and that that represents a a healthy balance between the two so you're not fully sympathetic so you're stressed out so yeah when i was stressed out during my studies i was pretty much all sympathetic you know when you can't switch off yeah. you're always buzzing um whereas when you sit in the middle that's that's the sweet spot and so what can we do to help bring our hrv up sleep sleep no, yeah, yeah uh sleep anything um anything that sort of uh calms the system so mm. uh breath work is parasympathetic uh, anything that calms the body down uh, post-training or post-stressor uh, is going to help with that. 
and then consistency as well. Mm. So yeah, those health behaviors, not drinking. I know <laughs> drinking tanks my HRV. Really? Um, right. And with most people, we see that. Um, yeah, so any, anything that makes you feel good, pretty much, yeah. Um, yeah, we should assist your HRV. And if you're using the data and you're using the WHOOP, mm. uh, you should see that, uh, it, yeah, reflected in the data. Well, that's something that I'll look at predominantly most days. Like, I'll, yep. I'll look at my sleep and then I'll look at my HRV because I sort of, I've, I've heard that having a higher HRV is good. What, yeah. What's probably a nor, like a normal level that we should be looking at or is it everyone just completely different and individual? There's no normal. No yeah. normal. Yeah, so it, it's completely individual. I've seen elite athletes with, HRV of 50 and a green recovery yep. like um, it's all relative to the person I think there is there is some evidence or, or some suggestion that having a higher one is better but not in all cases mm. so uh, as with all of the metrics that you might use with whoop um, we want to focus on your baseline and deviations from that baseline so if your HRV is usually 100 um, that's that's normal and then yeah just look at the trends there so if, if you're 50 and I'm 100 it doesn't mean that uh, I'm healthier per se it's just yeah your um, it's just the way your heart beats Mate, it's very cool to yeah. know um, one, one of the last questions that I have is around um, I guess people that stress about the data yeah. um, I know there's there's a lot of times and I've spoken to a few people in this room that when I look when I look at the app, I might be in the red, I might be in the orange. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a crappy day. Is mm -hmm. there any is there any advice or is there anything that you could let us know around for people who are who might be stressing about the data or yeah. might look into it a little bit? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point, and you'd think uh, wearable companies would hate that question, but the discussions I've had with everyone at Whoop for nigh on what six or seven years is they they really uh, want to answer that question as yeah. well. So uh, I think the Probably the best example is there was an athlete uh, went to the Olympics, didn't sleep at all the night before. They weren't wearing a whoop because it was pre-whoop and then broke a world record. Okay. So um, there is actually a term for the sleep version of this called orthosomnia. So people get obsessed with it to the point where it impacts their sleep mm -hmm. and makes them sleep terribly because they're really obsessed with it. But what I would say is uh, don't catastrophize one night of bad sleep. Uh, it, it's an aid. Like if you use it correctly, it's going to really help you. Mm. Um, on the HRV side of it, it can be a bit more variable sometimes because it is impacted by behaviour. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I would just say have a have the mindset of uh, looking at your data over a, a longer period of time, whether that's two weeks or a month, and uh, contextualise it like that rather than um, looking at the red and and freaking out a little bit. Beautiful. Um, before we throw out to the audience, we will have a couple of questions, but mate, what do you think is the biggest thing that we missed today? What do you think is the biggest thing that, that we didn't cover that you probably think is relevant for everyone listening today? We did pretty well to cover everything. I think if you if you go home and change anything or uh, it would be the light. Yep. Um, is a, it's a really huge area at the moment. Um, there's a recent book um, by Russell Foster, if I can't remember the title of it, but if you Google Russell Foster, it'll come up. Um, he's a professor at Oxford. Uh, and it's sort of the area of sleep that's like, all the scientists know how it works, but it hasn't really been spread out to the masses mm. yet. So yeah, that's probably, if you take anything away from today, is controlling that light um, day to day. May I know what I'm doing when I get home. Um, we're gonna throw <laughs> out to the, we're gonna throw out to the audience. Uh, guys, is there any, any questions that anyone else has? Yeah, right at the front. Um, with like jet lag, what is something that, because you said like if you're in Paris this time, this time, like yep. what is something that you could kind of like follow no matter where you are on whatever time zone? Yeah, you can't, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so it depends which direction. So uh, east is worse than west um, and depends where you're coming from, what your sleep timings are and um, where you're going. Uh, and for athletes when they're competing as well. Um, so that's all the information um, I get from the athletes. So uh, unfortunately, no, we, there are some um, resources like Jetlag Rooster, like sites that you can go on that are generally pretty good. They'll give you pretty good advice. But uh, if anyone is going overseas, I'm happy to, to write up a plan. <laughs> What's the ideal amount of like REM sleep, uh, light sleep, deep sleep, like for an average athlete? It's a good question. We probably don't have enough data, to be honest, because it's really hard to get athletes into the lab. Um, and we, I say, researchers, not work. Um, it, it, it's basically a percentage. So um, 
it will fluctuate throughout your life cycle. So depending on your age, if I have an 18 year old athlete and a 30 year old athlete, their sleep's gonna look very different. Um, but usually it'll be about 60-ish uh, percent light sleep and then between 15% and whatever 20% for the other two for slow wave sleep and REM sleep. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about um, the actual numbers as such more if they change. So if your REM depletes completely and you're also feeling really unwell or you're not training as well, um, then there might be something to flag with a practitioner or a physiologist or something. Um, but yeah, that's probably the best way to manage that stuff. Yeah. Like, how do you nap? Like, how is <laughs> <laughs> Can we give Millie uh, some tips over here? Yeah. <laughs> I would love to be able to. I yeah. Like, I'm so exhausted and I can't nap. Like, okay, so yeah. I'm not a great napper either. I never nap. Um, so s we have this, some people have a stronger drive for sleep. Um, the, uh, the best thing you can just do is make sure the environment is, uh, is good for it. And if you can't, um, then yeah, I wouldn't worry too much. If, if you physically can't nap, um, that means your, your body doesn't absolutely need it, if that makes sense. So if, yeah, if it was critical and you were sleep deprived enough to the point uh, that you needed to nap, um, not, not to say that it wouldn't help if you could, um, then yeah, your body would, would nap. Yeah. So don't stress if you can't. When the app breaks it down into like REM sleep, light sleep, it's considered, how does the device actually determine that? How does it know? Yeah, so those little lights that you see behind there. So basically what that is measuring is uh, pulse rate. So how often um, the heart beats blood through your arm, basically, or wherever you have the whoop on. Uh, it also measures movement. So typically, like the devices we used to use in the lab, like the old antiquated ones, were just movement. So it's a combination of movement. So basically when you're still, you're assumed to be asleep. Um, and then... HRV as well, and, and deviations in heart rate. So um, Whoop does a really good job. It's actually really difficult to do this from the wrist, <laughs> um, given that the way we measure sleep is through the brain. Um, so yeah, it's a combination. I, actually, it's proprietary. So I think if I told you, someone would uh, kill me, and I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, th those metrics, and all the metrics that you see in the app, it'll be a combination of all those respiratory rate um, and all of those. Yeah, and that'll evolve. So when I first started working with Emily and the team, there was no respiratory rate. So it, it, compl it evolves. Cheers. Is there much evidence to show that there's a link between lack of sleep and being sick? Yes. Yes, yeah, so there's plenty of stuff on this. So even, even with um, like flu shots and vaccinations, we know that they're not as effective if the night before you didn't sleep very well. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a strong link between the immune system and, and sleep, so we're definitely more compromised um, when we're not, not sleeping well. Um, and there's a few mechanisms for that, but yeah, definitely if, you, um, if you're traveling or something, it's a really high risk for, for catching something on a plane or something, really try to go into that well-rested. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a definite link, yeah. Taylor, at the back. Do you have any tips for sleeping after competing? Obviously it's hard to <laughs> yeah. especially if you're playing live. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a tricky one and I don't see many athletes that uh, get a fantastic night's sleep, especially after night um, games, but I think not to worry about it. If you can go to bed earlier, I know there's media commitments and, and a lot of the time we use caffeine as a yeah. performance supplement and then you, you're all buzzed when you usually would go to bed. Um, there are some ways you could move the body clock um, but it's probably something I'd work on one-on-one -on -one with someone rather than tell them how to do it because you can do it uh, in the wrong way. But I would just not worry about it and plan for the next day. So try and nap the next day um, to, to recuperate that sleep. And I'm sure you, you do that already. But yeah, night of or night after um, competition is, yeah, just do what you can basically. So I've got one here and then we'll go to Brie. Um, in terms of research, who are you testing on? Like, is it... Females, yeah. like I know, women's sport is coming into its own era. Um, a lot more girls are playing. Is the research research in terms of you know males, or are we judging? Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, and there was a recent paper that showed that only four percent of sports science research had an only female cohort. Yeah. So it is something that's being addressed. I don't know, uh, Kristen. Holmes at Whoop is a real strong driver of this. Um, to yeah, the, the 
the notion that uh, women are not small men in terms of the data. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's a real focus of mine, like, um, to, to do both. So we've done some research in AFLW, so I can speak to a little bit of that, but some of the research, unfortunately, yeah, is uh, assumptions based on data collected way back when. But it's a great question and an area that Whoop can definitely assist with because, yeah, so many female athletes on the platform. Great. Uh, yeah, there's a number of ways to answer this. The first way I'll answer it is that I don't use any. Um, melatonin is, uh, is an interesting one and will make you sleepy and will help you sleep. Um, but if you use it in the wrong way, it'll be way worse for your sleep. Um, so definitely if, you, if you're considering using melatonin, and it's probably more of a consideration for people in the States because it's so easy to get it over there. Um, definitely talk to someone, and I'm happy to talk to people if you are using melatonin, um, how to use it. Um, but in terms of, yeah, you, you can supplement with magnesium or um, tart cherry juice has some evidence around it. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a number of uh, supplements that you can use, but n none that I would say are essential. Yeah. Just, just on that, um, with supplements, is the way that we naturally producing melatonin yeah. by blocking out the blue and the green light when it's only red light coming in? If we could remove that light from our nighttime routine, would we naturally produce melatonin to help us sleep? Yeah, correct. Yeah, so you're always going to produce uh, melatonin about two hours before you usually go to bed. Yeah. Um, unless, yeah, you, you have bright light shined in your eyes. Uh, so. If you if you made those behavioural changes and, and had that routine into bed, you probably in absence of a sleep disorder or, or potentially insomnia on the on the more clinical side, it, yeah, you shouldn't need to use melatonin. Uh, but then we're talking about a pretty unique population in athletes, so you're under high demand. Um, so potentially, yeah, there might be something uh, in fact. When I, when I was doing that, I slept well, but then I started supplementing magnesium at night, and I slept even better. Yeah, and I, I, I'll reiterate that i'm not saying don't take um the these mel these um supplements probably melatonin in more consideration than the magnesium magnesium won't hurt so uh if it's not going to hurt then it's fine uh, it might help some people might not help others um yeah I've, I've taken magnesium in the past as well so uh, my general rule is not to yuck anyone's yum as long as it's not gonna uh, impact their sleep so if, if you were um having a shot of coffee then yeah i would have an issue with that but yeah if you're having magnesium or tart cherry juice before bed, then that's completely fine. Yeah. Okay. How many hours of restorative sleep should we get in, like, per night if I play, like, as a percentage? No. I had, like, zero percent restorative, like, two nights ago, and I had, like, seven hours sleep. Yeah. I would just... Uh, what I would say is focus on a deviation to your baseline. So if it went down to zero... Uh, it potentially may have been some sort of intricacy with your sleep that night that through whatever um, data that it collected out. So sometimes you might have, depending on if it's a high training period, you might have uh, little ect ectopic heartbeats that might throw off the data a little bit sometimes. For the most part, it won't. Um, so if you see really crazy data like that, that you've got zero REM or zero restorative, don't freak out. Um, it may just be because, yeah, you're an athlete and sometimes your physiology is, sits outside of what um, is the norm, if that makes sense. Um, so if that happens from time to time, don't stress. Um, and yeah, if, if it keeps happening, then yeah, feel free to reach out or it's the team at Whoop is really uh, helpful in that sense. We've got one more, one more question, yeah. If your REM sleep is small, is there any way to improve it or is it just kind of like an hour's thing you have to put the hours together? Uh, consistency. Yeah, so having the same, well, having as much as possible, having the same bedtime and wake up time um, and trying to, I know it's really hard and I don't, I don't nail it either, is weekend to weekday sleep. Um, trying to keep that as consistent as possible. Um, we do have a thing called social jet lag where everyone goes out on the weekends and socialise and then on Monday morning uh, you're super tired because you actually are jet lagged a few hours because you've been operating on a different schedule. So yeah for REM and sleep staging is really just consistency is the main thing. And if you have children... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. I can't help you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one's a tricky one. 
that would probably flip my focus into getting you through the day um, around optimal use of caffeine uh, and making sure that, yeah, if you're driving, that you are okay to be driving at that time um, and potentially fitting in naps around that. So, yeah, the behavioural stuff and the family stuff is, uh, yeah, something we sometimes can't control. Beautiful. Um, Dean, thank you so much for your time today, mate. I know thank a lot you. of us got a lot, a lot out of this um, in terms of whoop and sleep and performance and recovery. So, mate, uh, I appreciate a lot. Um, I think, yeah, we've all got some really great takeaways. So, big round of applause for Dr. Dean Miller. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks.